Welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Mix, where we highlight the highs and lows of a particular Saturday morning cartoon and maybe some weekday ones that I, as well as many of us, grew up with and to show why these awesome Saturday morning cartoons made weekends and weekdays just the best and why seeing them now instantly brings back glorious memories of those carefree childhood days. At the center of the galaxy in the far reaches of the universe is the planet Symbion. As increasing sophistication brought unimaginable technological advances, including control over every aspect of their environment, the inevitable happened. The paradise began to collapse and a great cataclysm began. Frightening changes took place that could not be stopped. This fallout of civilization gave rise to chaos, resulting in the planet becoming a harsh and foreboding world where warring tribes struggled for survival. The environment first became unstable, then deranged, creating all manner of strange weather and mutated creatures. Among these creatures, only the strong survived. Both good and evil, the best and the worst evolved where the noble citizens of the Shining Realm are locked in mortal combat with the denizens of the Dark Domain. Telepathically bonded in combat, Sektar warriors join with their insect companions in the ultimate battle for survival. This is their story. Far reaches of the universe is the star planet Symbion, a perfect world until their biological experiments exploded, creating an exotic realm beyond all belief. As mutant life forms ravaged their global paradise, a new and incredible species emerged, the Sectars. With Prince Dargon leading his warriors of the Shining Realm against the evil General Spydrax, he would destroy all to rule all. His terror troops of the Dark Domain know no mercy. The brave, the bold, and the fearless stand with Dargon. The brutal and cruel attack with Spydrax. These are the Sectars, the warriors of Symbion. Sectars, Warriors of Symbion was a line of action figures released by Coleco in 1985 and was created by Lawrence Mass, Maureen Trotto, and Tim Clark and was licensed by Seven Towns. The series itself ran from September 14th of 1985 through October 12th of the same year and only lasted for five episodes. The premise was that somewhere in space, somewhere in time, exists a planet called Symbion, where a genetic experiment fails. The result? A world where insects and arachnids grow to frightening proportions. A world where the inhabitants have taken on the awesome characteristics of insects and arachnids. Prince Dargon, ruler of the peaceful Shining Realm, and his allies are in conflict with the forces of Spydrax in the Dark Domain. The two armies waging a never-ending war to obtain possession of the Hive, a fortress from a long-forgotten civilization that holds the key to ultimate power. The episode begins with Spydrax and his army of the Dark Domain attacking a village near the capital city of the Shining Realm. They begin by burning the skull fields and the town itself, leaving its villagers to run away from the onslaught. As this is occurring, Prince Dargon prepares to face Spydrax alone, but Chief Counselor and Sage Advisor to Dargon, Mantor, warns him that it would be foolish to do so. Nevertheless, Dargon heads to confront Spydrax, but not before commanding Mantor to lead the Sektar army in defending their home, the Shining Realm. 
As a battle ensues between the Sectars who fight for the Shining Realm and the Dark Domain, it is revealed that this attack was just a distraction to lure Prince Dargon away from his men and that the real reason for the attack was for Spydrax to obtain a map in Mantor's possession that he believes will reveal the location of the Hive of the Ancients, making him the ruler of all Symbian. As Spydrax confronts Dargon in an aerial battle aboard their respective steeds, Skeeto, a Dark Domain soldier, sneaks away with Toxid to steal the map from Mantor's lab while Skulk and Trancula take care of the guards. As Skeeto finally finds what he came for, Mantor interrupts, but just when Mantor seems to have the upper hand, Toxid sprays him with venom, leaving him immobilized. Skeeto then informs Spydrax that he has the map, leaving him to call his troops for an immediate retreat. As Spydrax's army retreats the Shining Realm, a frustrated Dargon wants to follow, but is warned by Pinsor that night is approaching, and unlike the residents of the Dark Domain, they cannot see at night. The troops of the Shining Realm are happy to have won the day, but Dargon isn't convinced by the easy win. A fellow inhabitant of the Shining Realm by the name of Secor offers his services to join up in the fight, but Dargon and Pinsor insist he is too young, leaving him even more determined to prove himself to Dargon and crew. Later, in Mantor's lab, Pinsor revives the immobilized Mantor, who then reveals to everyone that the map has been stolen and that they must get it back before Spydrax achieves his goal in finding the Hive of the Ancients. As Dargon prepares to take off after Spydrax, he is then confronted again by Secor who offers his help yet again, but alas, he is told his help is not needed. Now determined to prove himself, Secor and Ultifly make their way to Spydrax's castle, but are quickly surrounded seconds after landing and captured by Spydrax's soldiers, leaving Ultifly to escape and find help, but not before being injured during the initial attack. Later that night, as the villains celebrate their victory of retrieving the map, the guards bring the recently captured Secor. Spydrax, realizing that Dargon must be close, sets a plan to deal with the approaching heroes once and for all. Dargon, Zack, and Bitor make their way to Spydrax's chamber where the awaiting ambush awaits our heroes and a battle commences. During the ensuing battle, Dargon procures the map but the victory is fleeting as he and friends are obviously outnumbered. It is only when a timely rescue by Spider-Flyer occurs that our heroes manage to get away from Spydrax's castle and what could have been their untimely demise. Later, at Stellara's tavern, the heroes try to heal their wounds and figure out how to stop Spydrax from reaching the Hive of the Ancients. It is then that Mantor mentions that all hope may not be lost, for he knows the map well and remembers the way. But first, they must sail across the Lake of Blood. It is during this voyage through the Lake of Blood that the heroes of the Shining Realm are hard on the trail of Spydrax's ship. Out of sheer desperation to lose the opposing ship that is now en route to closing in on them, Spydrax orders his men to head the ship toward the island of the Web Widow. Fearing that they will be enchanted by the song of the Web Widow, Spydrax advises his crew to fill their ears with beeswax to avoid her hypnotic melody, avoiding any chance of falling into her trap. As the music of the Web Widow's web harp reaches Dargon's ship, its crew are suddenly overpowered by the enchanting melody and head towards its direction. Dargon, who was below deck and not affected, begins to realize that his fellow shipmates are under a spell but before he can do anything, he is knocked from the ship onto the Lake of Blood. As Pinsor, Zack, and Mantor make their way to the island and towards the Web Widow's castle, they become hopelessly ensnared in moments by her immobilizing web. Once fully trapped, the Web Widow inspects and carries her new guest into her web castle, for she has plans to feast on her newly adopted acquisitions. Once Dargon arrives on the island of the Web Widow, he coats himself in mud from the Lake of Blood so he does not stick to the walls of the Web Castle and ventures forth to save his friends. Entering the castle, Dargon tries to save his captured friends, but not before encountering the Web Widow herself. Although he is caught momentarily by her, 
Prince Dargon manages to free himself and quickly incapacitates her with his Ven gun, leaving the Web Widow out of commission long enough for everyone to get away. As the heroes continue onward through a forest, they spot the badly wounded Ultifly ahead. Managing to communicate with Ultifly by telebonding with the insect, Mantor finds out the exact location of Secor, who is still in the custody of Spydrax. It is then that the heroes come across a gigantic tunnel worm. Seeing that the tunnel worm's abilities to tunnel underneath large areas of soil could be of use to them, Dargon decides to use the worm for a surprise attack on Spydrax. As the worm emerges into the camp, the surprise attack is underway. While the two forces battle, Zack is able to free Secor, who in return saves Dargon's life by deflecting Spydrax's attack during their current encounter. Defeated, Spydrax vows to still reach the Hive of the Ancients and retreats along with his crew leaving the heroes to celebrate their victory. The heroes send Secor off but not before congratulating him on his bravery. Knowing this, he complies and heads back to the city of the Shining Realm. Zack, feeling relieved that this encounter is finally over, feels that the path ahead should be an easy venture but Mantor warns that nothing is over, for they still have to stop Spydrax from reaching the Hive. It is then that it's revealed that Spydrax along with his forces are on a cliff top above them, waiting for the moment to strike. Giving the command to fire, Spydrax and his men begin an all-out assault on our heroes, cascading them in a hail of weapons fire. But that was only the first episode as Prince Dargon and crew would encounter various schemes by Spydrax and his soldiers of the Dark Domain in their journey to reach the Hive of the Ancients, leading to the final confrontation in the fifth episode, Inside the Hive. Thanks to the overwhelming firepower of his forces and the weapons on the compound now at his disposal, it seems that Spydrax finally has the upper hand to crush his enemies. Despite this, Prince Dargon and crew fight through, ever determined to stop Spydrax in achieving his goal. As Dargon and Spydrax duel in the Hive's command center, an unfortunate mistake by Skulk results in the Hive self-destructing. As the Hive is falling apart around them, various heroes and villains alike flee, all except Dargon who was pinned beneath a slab of debris and left by Spydrax to be buried along the sinking compound. Feeling that they have won, Spydrax and his soldiers of the Dark Domain retreat, leaving the heroes to watch in horror as the Hive sinks into the ground. Believing that their leader has finally met his end, Mantor and Pinsor try to cope with their loss, but all sense of doubt is suddenly removed as they see Dargon emerge from the rubble. And with that, a victorious battle cry is raised and the series ends on a positive note. Surprisingly, as in previous episodes, the announcer says To be continued Suggesting that this miniseries wasn't simply an effort to help launch the toy line but for also introduce a planned weekly series. Unfortunately, that never happened. Oh, did you know? As mentioned earlier, sectars were created by Lawrence Mass, Maureen Trotto and Tim Clark. Now for those who might not know Tim Clark, he is a puppet builder who worked for the Jim Henson Company during the 1980s and was credited for creature design and fabrication supervision for the Mystics on the film The Dark Crystal. And built Uncle Traveling Matt from Fraggle Rock based on the Michael K. Fritz designs for the show. His work in toy design started with the Sectars and eventually led to one of his more remembered toy creations. Boglins. With its original run being released in 1997 and having a very faithful following, making them a very sold out and expensive series to collect. Again! Although Sectors were a relatively short-lived toy line, it produced a large amount of tie-in media and promotional materials thanks to Coleco's efforts to really push the concept. The Sectar stories were handled by Marvel Comics as they published an 8-issue limited series which expanded on the lore behind the toy line. Also, 
each sector toy included a mini comic that spotlighted the character or playset it came with, giving more background to the world of the sectors. From mini comics to hardcover books, there was a multitude of other book formats available, each expanding the lore and helping shape its universe to the point of an actual language being created. How cool is that? While on that subject, the artist behind some of the Sektar storybooks was none other than Earl H. Norum, a world-renowned artist who's worked on such Marvel comic projects as Savage Sword of Conan, Marvel Preview, Tales of the Zombie, Monsters Unleashed, Planet of the Apes, Rampaging Hulk, The Silver Surfer, and storybooks featuring Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four. But most of us might know his art from the various pieces he's done for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe magazine and toy art. A truly amazing artist that is adored and admired because of his art for anything and everything He-Man related. Finally, Ruby Spears Production, the company that produced the cartoon, no longer owns the rights to the series it helped create in 1985. All the rights to the five Sectars episodes that Ruby Spears produced were acquired by AOL Time Warner Cartoon Network some time ago. Sadly, nothing has been made of the series since the acquisition. Throughout the five episode miniseries, you can see that a lot of effort was placed in the universe that it was trying to build. Although much of the lore is found from the books that accompanied the toys and various storybooks available, this series did enough to entice those who have seen the cartoons to explore the universe of Symbion. I actually remembered owning a Battle Beetle and was amazed in how something like that could exist and be aimed towards kids. Using the nylon gloves to mimic its legs in a crawling manner was definitely something of an added bonus in my efforts to try and scare my younger siblings. Mind you, this was a time where scaring your younger sister or parents were the norm when it came to freaky toys. Watching these episodes and looking at the various ways Coleco tried to really push the concept, you can see that a lot of effort was placed from those involved trying to make this something beyond just a regular toy line. It's something about the concept and the toys themselves that have given those who remember the series many fond memories of the heroes of the Shining Realm and the villains of the Dark Domain. It's definitely a fun series that brings back a lot of joyous nostalgia. Take a chance on it. And maybe, just maybe, you might like it too. Thank you so much and remember when it comes to cartoons we grew up with that to truly appreciate something, you have to accept its strengths and its faults. No matter what they are because when that happens you can appreciate how amazing it was and how amazing it continues to be. Thank you so much and I'll see you all next time.